All right, well, um, so I'm Kathy Strandberg from NYU, and um, I am also going to talk about patentable subject matter, and uh, I'm actually going to um, follow in some ways, disagree, agree, and other ways with um, the speakers that have come before, but I am also definitely going to be trying to look at patentable subject matter um, from a consequentialist perspective. Um, so that's one thing that I think I'm very happy to hear that we're all trying to do because I think that's a very important thing to do. So, um, and, and some of this uh, may have already been, been covered, but so to try to do that, uh, first of all, I think we all agree that right now the doctrine lacks a clear justification. Um, and so the way I see the first principles question is, um, suppose I have an invention that's new, useful, and non-obvious, when should I not want that to be patented? Right? That should be the question, because that's the thing that 102, 103 doesn't take care of. Um, we also know that patenting has various benefits and costs, or at least we kind of assume that it does. So the benefits are to solve certain kinds of market failures um, by providing incentives for inventors to invest in inventing, disposing, disseminating inventions and a variety of costs, including the static deadweight loss that we have, um, a kind of tax on downstream innovation, and then a bunch of transaction costs relating to licensing, search, enforcement, and, and so forth. Uh, so I think the basic question is, all right, when will we expect to have the costs outweigh the benefits, and that's when we don't want to have patents. Um, so it might be, for example, that there's really no market failure. Um, when might that be the case? Well, when inventive costs are low, when the first mover advantages are high, um, and also, importantly, when there are other kinds of incentives, non-market incentives, that um, would in, in lead people to make these inventions. So some kinds of non-pecuniary incentives, or um, I've written about user innovation incentives. So that was one time kind of situation. Another kind of situation is when we think that the, uh, the deadweight loss or the tax on downstream innovation is especially high because the patent return is a lot bigger than the investment. Um, or maybe we think there are particularly high licensing or transaction costs in certain cases. Why would that be? Why would that happen? Maybe because the claim scope is really broad, so that's Morse example. Um, maybe because of even though the claim scope might not be broad, the scope of downstream uses is very broad and um, it requires a lot of licensing, that's Benson, maybe because there are unclear claim boundaries or maybe because we have highly inter interrelated claims that form a thicket that require a lot of licensing. And I just want to add one here that is really kind of my main uh, um, point or main thing I want to talk about and I'm talking about in this paper is that another reason why the costs might outweigh the benefits is that we might have other ways to deal with the mark of failures uh, besides patents. Uh, so I want to address this question which actually has come up already in the session of do we need patent subject matter to do this, right? And I think I would argue that yes, we do. And that's because the doctrines that we already have don't address all the questions. So non-obviousness asks essentially the question of did this invention require substantial investment? That's essentially what non-obviousness is asking, and we're using that as a rough proxy for another question, which is would the market produce this invention even without a patent? The scope doctrines, which I'm kind of broadly referring to 112 type, uh, 112 doctrines, um, ask, are, so ask, well, is the claim commensurate with what the patentee actually invented? Why do we care about this from a um, consequentialist point of view. Well, we can see this as some kind of rough proxy for are the returns from the patent commensurate with the patentee's investment, right? Somehow we're trying to match those up. And then we have something like indefiniteness, which asks are the boundaries of this claim clearly specified, um, which relates to the transaction cost concerns. Um, so that's kind of what our, uh, at least how I would very quickly say what our other doctrines are doing. But what are they not doing? What they're not doing is they're not asking whether there are other ways to solve the market failures. Um, and no matter what we do to treat those doctrines, we're not going to address that question. So if we want to address that question, I argue that we should, but you might disagree, um, 
we have to do something else. Um, but, and the reason I think I would make that argument is that we know that there are sometimes, and maybe even often, alternatives um, to patent, patents to solve these market failures. So non-pecuniary incentives, user incentives, um, we use direct procurement sometimes, we use, and that can be from the government, or that could be something like Kickstarter, crowdsourced. Um, there are reputational systems that rely on norms and reciprocity. Um, we have government subsidies for science, for example, prizes, contests, etc. So there are definitely alternative ways to solve the market failure if they exist. Um, so the question is, when do we want to use the patent system as opposed to something else? Um, I also wanted to make a point that the, the preemption theory for um, patentable subject matter, um, which the court is not always kind of brings up, um, I think is also quite inadequate. Um, and I think the reason it's inadequate is that preemption theory essentially is assuming that patentable subject matter is about the failure of scope doctrines. So, Basically, if tailoring claim breadth to actual invention, which is what the scope doctrines do, um, is, as it almost certainly is, a kind of flawed way to match patent return to investment, then we might worry about this need for, about preemption, right? Um, and that might especially be true in what I call the Benson type cases, the cases where the claim scope is actually pretty narrow, but the scope of downstream impact is broad, the research tool type cases. Um, and the scope doctrines might not be doing a good job of that, and they also don't account for the fact that there might be high downstream transaction costs. Um, so that's right, um, but the problem with preemption as a theory for patentable subject matter exclusion is, first of all, that the patentable subject matter exclusion, so now we say, okay, fine, we're going to exclude this from patentability, we haven't fixed our incentive problems or our market failure problems. Those are still there, and this is a critique that people make of patentable subject matter exclusion, which I agree. Um, also, of course, it doesn't consider what other else we might be doing to solve these market failures. Okay, so now here's getting to what, um, what I wanted to argue, is that whether we like it or not, patentable subject matter doctrine inevitably impacts the choices between different innovation institutions. Why is that? Well, if it's not patentable subject matter, then you know what's going to take its place. And if there is patentable subject matter, then we may, in many circumstances, be undermining or at least making more expensive um, alternatives. And as an example of what I mean by that, um, the availability of patents can facilitate uh, defection from a norms-based system, or at least make it more expensive to um, enforce the norms-based system. So m what I would argue, what I'm arguing in the paper, is that in the best of all possible worlds, we, we should be deploying the doctrine consciously um, to make these institutional choices. Um, why should we do that? Because patents are socially costly, always, um, although they also may have benefits. Um, especially costly for some technologies, um, and they may be costly, more costly than alternatives, even in the situations where the competitive market does, has failures. So there may just be better alternatives, and patentable subject matter doctrine should take that into account. Um, so what would that, that kind of a patentable subject matter doctrine look like? Um, it would be categorical exclusions um, that would be based on the availability or our choice as a, as a society to use a socially preferable alternative institution. And I'll give you one example of that. Um, we could think of the natural phenomena exception um, as being based not on some sort of you know, philosophical concept of what's natural and what's not natural. You can see I'm not fond of that approach to it. Um, but instead of being based on the fact that we have this other system called, you know, sometimes the Republic of Science or, you know, whatever, the norms of science. We have this publicly funded other system that is dealing with the market failures in that arena, and we have reasons for doing that for certain kinds of, certain kinds of discoveries. 
In fact, although the court never says that it's doing this, if you read the cases about natural phenomena, um, the court is very often relying uh, on the existence of this alternative institution in saying that there is a natural phenomena exception. Uh, and I think that's why the court doesn't worry about the fact that hours of toil, you know, whatever, as, as Justice Breyer says, are invested, but still no patent for you. It's because the court has in mind that there's this other system in the back. Um, so that's how you would figure out the, what the exclusions would be. Um, the first, then you would, again, you would have a two-step kind of analysis, and the first step would be, does the claim contain an element that could have been produced by the alternative institution? So, for example, the natural phenomenon is a discovery or invention that's likely to come out of this <coughs> republic of science, for example. The second step would be, um, is the element applied in a way that this alternative institution, neither the institu alternative institution nor the market, would have produced? In other words, is there a market failure in transferring the thing from the institution, the alternative institution, out into the market? Um, is the patent incentive necessary to induce application of the natural phenomenon in the claimed way? And I would also argue that Mayo is doing this a bit. Um, and I won't go into that now for time, but I think I have some stuff in, I don't know, I've had so many versions of this paper. I think it's in the version that I posted. Um, but we could make that much more sensible if we thought about it as this is what we're trying to do. Okay, so how would we do this? How would we make this institutional comparison? Um, we could look at different kinds of factors to see when we think that there might be, the patent system might not be necessary, and these are a list of some of them. Um, whether, you know, they're high cost, et cetera, et cetera. And we would worry about the potential for anti-competitive or anti-social effects of an alternative system also. Um, so then comes to the question that, um, you know, is the usual response I get when I give this, this talk. Um, isn't this approach impractical? Uh, well, certainly this approach is not um, something we're going to do tomorrow because, you know, the courts are going to read my paper and go, oh, okay, I will do that. Um, but is it impractical in a sort of longer term um, way? And I think the answer is no, or at least the answer is no more impractical than a lot of other stuff that we have to do. Um, <clears throat> because of the fact that Again, as I mentioned before, whether we like it or not, when we keep subject matter in the patent system, it does shape the institutional choices. So we can't pretend that we can do nothing. There's no nothing. We are making a decision. So I think it's better, given that, that we address it explicitly. Um, the other advantage, I think, to this approach um, is, and I'm not also saying that this is necessarily the only reason to have patentable subject matter exclusions. I think it is one. Um, is that this grounds the analysis in the kind of issues that even though they're difficult, they are conducive to things like evidence and legal arguments. So, you know, is there an alternative institutional system? Well, are there non-pecuniary motivations? These are the kind of things that lawyers can produce evidence about. Um, and courts can consider. Then there is the question, of course, who should define the excluded categories. Um, I think I wouldn't go to Congress, and that's because I don't think that these excluded categories are necessarily going to be forever and ever and never change. Uh, because maybe we'll decide we don't want to fund science anymore. I sincerely hope not. But if we do, we got to have some way to solve the market failures, maybe patents, I don't know. Um, so I think rather than that, I would say that in a perfect world, I would probably say an expert agency. Um, probably not the patent office as it currently exists, but an expert agency that would be much more about economics, um, sort of like what we do in the antitrust area. But I'm also not totally, you know, I don't think the courts are, are would be at a complete loss here because courts do consider similarly complex economic issues in, for example, antitrust. Uh, and then I'll get to probably the, maybe the most um, uh, 
a controversial point that I want to make where I'm completely the opposite of the previous speaker, which is what should we, what should be the default? So we have a new technology coming along, what should be the default? Should it be to patentable or not patentable? And I'm not sure what I think about this, but I want to at least suggest that it might be better to say let's start with no patents. Um, why? Well, because we know, at the very beginning, we know that at the very least we can avoid a deadweight loss if we don't have patents. Um, this one would give alternatives an opportunity to develop, um, and we wouldn't end up in the situation that we were in with respect to um, the DNA patents of saying, wow, there's all this um, invested interest here, we can't really change now, right? We're sort of stuck. Um, and also give us an opportunity to listen to the voices of those in the field, who I don't think should be given like a veto decision here for the reason that there could be anti-competitive uh, reasons. But if the people working in a field are saying, hey, we don't want patents, I think we ought to listen to that, right? Maybe not, it's not decisive, but it's something that should be taken into account in uh, the policy analysis. So that's it. That's what I have to say. Thanks. Uh, yeah, please. So I, I like this project as you know, I think the thinking about how patentable subject matter exceptions intersect with the many incentives we have beyond IP is really important. And I guess my, my question is how we think about which way the, the arrow should run and why you have it going the way you do. So one approach, which I think you're advocating, is to think about the existing realm of non-patent incentives and then define patentable subject matter around them which I think would require then the exceptions to change depending on if suddenly Congress enacts a new orphan drug act or something that's providing more incentives for a particular area, then we need to change patents in that area. Um, and then the, the alternative is to say, okay, we're going to find patentable subject matter based on whatever and then um, have other systems of incentives work around that to fill in the gaps where we need to have additional incentives. Right. Yeah, yeah, you're right. It could go either way. My worry about doing it the second way, I mean, and there are worries either way, I agree, but my worry about doing it the second way is that when we have um, technological advances that you know, really change the cost-benefit trade-offs of different, uh, different uh, ways of approaching this, you know, the internet is like the big example there, um, then we might get stuck. Um, and so, you know, I'm inclined to say, and this is partly because I think that we, we already know that patents are have this dead weight loss, right? So I don't know why we should think, wow, we're going to mostly privilege this approach. Um, but you're right. I mean, it could, you could do it either way. I'm just worried that we wouldn't get, ironically, we wouldn't get the benefits of technology, technological innovation, if we, if we do that. Yeah, Peter. So, I like the project a lot. Um, it strikes me that patent eligibility is a binary question. Right? You're in or you're out. But a lot of these axes are really questions of degree. So you could have a fully publicly funded drug, you could have a fully privately funded drug, but what about something that has both sources of funding? Is that in or out? So I'm wondering if you're going to actually establish some uh, specialized institution, why not choose a policy lever with more kind of degrees of calibration? So the actual length of the patent term, or uh, remedies to the damages. Very <laughs> right, exactly. As opposed to kind of a very stark on or off. Yeah, decision. yeah, I, yeah. That's that's right. And and I so I have thought about that too. And and some of you might know that I've written a kind of fair use approach that would be taking account of these same factors. I guess what I'm worried about there, and maybe it's less than more of a worry in different. I mean, it definitely is less and more of a worry in different situations, is that is exactly this, this problem of if we have both, you can have a patent or you can, and you can not have a patent, that we might have this problem of undermining the alternative, the alternative institution. And I don't think that the fair use or remedies approach gets at that. Um, Another reason to have it actually goes back to this point about clarity, right? That if we just say, you can't have a patent on business methods, okay, we'll have some debate at the big boundaries of what's a business method, but people will know, and they won't have to wait until after, you know, talk to the copyright people about how much they, they 
how, much, how useful fair use is for the person who's trying to use the copyrighted thing. Susan, so, yeah. Thank you. Uh, so uh, it, it, I'm a little confused at times as to whether you're supplying a rationale for what you think the courts have been doing, or what the no. Supreme Court has been doing, no. So you're offering them a new, new guidance, because this is not, decidedly not what they've been uh, right. doing. Now, I'm a little confused by that, then, in response to your, your, your answer to the, the, the last question, uh, which where you seem to sort of embrace copyright fair use, uh, or, as, or patent fair use as something that might uh, uh, achieve some of these same uh, uh, goals because, uh, you know, the, the Supreme Court actually has been worried when they express that there's this republic of science going on, they're worried about the impact of patents on that rather than about the existence of that as a reason why you don't need patents. They're, they're worried about a, 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 a different problem, right? They're, and uh, that might be better addressed by some sort of a fair use uh, 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 limitation. If you're worried about the impact on science, you could exempt uh, uh, science from improvement. No, that's, that's not what you're, what you're worried about. Okay. No, but, that is what I'm worried about, oh, actually. Yeah. That is what I'm worried but about. But I think that wouldn't do it. But I don't think that would do it. And the reason it doesn't do it is it, it, does, it means that scientists don't have to worry about any infringers. But it, doesn't, but it also means that they can go off and get patents, so they can defect. And that's... That, I think, is actually the bigger concern. And they could now, under these, uh, right. they could under almost any set of rules that I could imagine, because, uh, unless it looks really different from what we have right now, because we don't have these broad categorical exclusions that create a patent-free zone. Instead, we have limitations that mean you can't patent it this way, but if you add certain structural limitations into your claim language, or if you add certain treatment steps, Actually, that didn't work in Mayo, but you know, I don't know exactly what it is. But now it's like the, the patentable subject matter rules are not like broad rules that you can apply at the front door and say, you, ineligible. Instead, you bring your patent application in and they say, well, this one's okay, this one's not okay. Um, and so you're going to have defectors unless you have a radically different. Well, doctor. you could, the, the way you would defect, the way you would defect is you. If let's, so let's talk about the natural phenomena one because yeah. it's the easy one, or nicest one to think about now, I think. The way you would defect under this system is you would um, invest enough in a, a, making an application of your, um, of your uh, whatever you discovered um, that it's something that wouldn't come up with the market and wouldn't come naturally out of what's, what's naturally done with by scientists. So yeah, I mean, you could do, you could do that. And, but that, I don't think that would be defecting in the same way, right? Because you would, you would have to put in that extra investment. No, not necessarily. So. You just have to put in the investment of hiring a patent lawyer to add in claim limitations. Well, no, but that's what I'm saying you couldn't do, right? That's what the second step would do. Yeah. That's what the second step would do. The second step would say, no, that's not enough. Right. Yes.